Okay, I think we can get started now. We've got a quorum, 42 people. Um, hopefully there'll be a few more people joining um, soon. Can I get a quick check, Adam, uh, Nick and Stuart, whether you can hear me and see my presentation as well? Sure can, loud and clear. Yeah. Yep, all good. Awesome. Thanks, well, let's get started then. So thanks uh, for joining today's MuleSoft meetup, the Melbourne meetup. As you know, we're doing this every about three months. Um, really happy to have you all on board. Um, this time it's virtual again. Initially, we were planning to do this in person, but quickly had to change plans. So again, as mentioned before, we're working hard at the moment to making either the next meetup or the one after that in person. Uh, hopefully see you then. So <clears throat> um, a bit of housekeeping before we get started. So again, uh, use the chat function to ask uh, any questions or, or have any comments. Uh, later on, we will do a Kahoot game. So for those of you who uh, attended meetups or our meetups before. Uh, you will know the drill there. Um, it's really recommended to use Kahoot on your mobile phone. So there's a Kahoot app that you can download um, or you can go to a web browser on your mobile phone and search for Kahoot there. I will give you the address later on. So that's, uh, that's for the trivia later on at around 6.40. Uh, just by way of introduction, um, I'm one of your of the two local meetup leaders here in Melbourne. My name is Daniel Sofner. I'm a strategic technical architect uh, as part of the CS Group, Customer Success uh, at MuleSoft. Been with MuleSoft for um, about two years. I think first of July is my two-year anniversary, so it's been going quite quickly. Um, I pretty much always worked in integration land, uh, worked quite a bit of time in IBM and Red Hat as well. And um, pretty much, I think, started doing it, uh, integration work about 20 years ago. And I'm really happy at MuleSoft here and, and working with a lot of the customers amongst, I guess, a few of them are on, on the meetup as well, um, quite closely. I'll quickly hand over to Adam uh, to introduce himself as well. Thanks, Daniel. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Adam Bond. I'm a solution engineer based here in Melbourne. So uh, by way of introduction, I've been at MuleSoft just over two years now. Um, but you know, prior to, to coming to MuleSoft, I had over you know, 10 years experience in the integration space. Um, and you know, of what's really drawn me to this, this company and being a part of MuleSoft is really you know, the technology, the approach, and also the people and the culture, which comes down to also the community that we have here. So, um, you know, really excited and you know, still get really energized to be part of these meetups and speak with all of you. And um, yeah, I want to continue these conversations. And I just hope you get um, you know a lot out of tonight because we've got a really good lineup of uh, content for you. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Adam. Fantastic. So yeah, please introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know where you're from. I've uh, got a good cross-section, people from India, um, Australia, New Zealand. Maybe we get people from Europe as well. We had that, I think, last time. So if you can do that. Um, agenda for today. So I'll do a few updates, um, and then I will hand over to Stuart Pilkington from Victoria University and Nick Bowman from Capgemini. So Capgemini is one of our strategic partners uh, in the MuleSoft space. Probably a lot of you on the call will have worked with Capgemini already. So both of them will present on how to secure APIs on the MuleSoft platform and will use the example of Victoria University for that. So really, really I'm looking forward to that. A super interesting presentation. Um, but, and then afterwards, I'll hand over to Adam again. Uh, he will give a, an overview of our product roadmap. So an overview of what's coming over the next six months or so. And Adam will also showcase uh, one of our newer products that we just rolled out a few weeks ago, um, Datagraph, AnyPoint Datagraph. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the use cases uh, for that product and do a bit of a show and tell there. And then we'll round it out uh, by doing trivia and a Kahoot game with some prizes that can be won there. 
so before we get started, um, a few slides here on, on activities that could be of interest to you. Um, so we do have these city meetups that are happening on a regular basis, but we also have online an online meetup group. Um, for those of you who are following the meetups, you'll be aware of that already. But for those of you who are new to the meetup, uh, please check them out. Um, we usually post super interesting videos um, and demonstrations about our products or specific technologies uh, around the mules of any point platforms. Right? Um, I'll post that link in the chat so you can uh, check it out as well. What we also have is um, a, an initiative that we started about a year ago. It's called, it's called Friends of Max. So these are short videos, usually about 10 to 20 minutes of length, um, where we're sort of showcasing specific technical topics around the Mulesoft platform. It's, it's pretty much targeted at developers. Um, so you'll see a lot of topics around how to set up any point service mesh, for example, uh, different options of API manager, the importance of CI, CD, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, just check that out. It's on YouTube. Just Google or go into YouTube and search for MuleSoft Friends of Max, uh, and you will find a, now a sizable number of videos that, that you can digest. It's quite, quite helpful as well if you're a Mule developer and architect. Um, another event that is happening in a couple of weeks' time um, that's pretty much an, a virtual event that will drill into a lot more detail how to integrate MuleSoft with the Salesforce Service Cloud. So if you're part of an organization that uses the Salesforce Service Cloud and you are already uh, using MuleSoft or thinking about using MuleSoft, then that should be uh, quite an interesting event. Uh, it's happening on the 14th of July. Uh, between 11 and 12 o'clock, and it's fully virtual. I will post a link to the registration page in the chat as well, uh, if you're interested in that. All right, and um, what I also wanted to call out, so uh, we have a lot of meetups happening at the same time, and you know every week there's a meetup. So today we are in a sort of a bit of a unique situation that directly after this meetup, there's another one that's uh, happening in Singapore. So thankfully, we don't have any overlap there. So when we stop our meetup uh, at, at 7 p.m., it's going to be 5 p.m. in Singapore. So if, if you feel like you want to continue and you like the content, I recommend uh, go to their meetup page and sign up for that and join their event straight after this one. Um, topic will be um, integration um, with the Salesforce Marketing Cloud using MuleSoft, also a super interesting event. So that's that. And yeah, so what's next? So if you like um, this meetup um, or if you want to speak at the meetup as well, um, if you are using MuleSoft in your platform um, and you want to maybe showcase how you're using uh, the platform, then feel free to reach out. Um, we will send out a survey feedback form afterwards. I know we're sort of overwhelmed nowadays with uh, with a lot of emails with an ask for, for survey feedback. So if you find a minute or two to provide us with that feedback, that would be super helpful. And always feel free to you know tweet about our, uh, about our meetups um, or LinkedIn or on LinkedIn as well. So and as mentioned before, the next Melbourne meetup is planned for September. We usually run it every three months. So end of March was the last one. Now it's end of June. So next one is planned for end of September. We're planning to do that, hopefully in person. Okay, so without further ado, I want to hand over to Nicholas Bowman from Capgemini, one of our premier partners, and Stuart Pilkington from Victoria University one of our clients and customers. Um, and they're gonna be talking about how to secure APIs on the MuleSoft platform. We'll provide some, some real examples how our clients are using the platform. So I will stop sharing now and um, hand over to you, Nick. Great. 
Thanks a lot. No, I'm very, very, very excited to be here tonight. We did plan an in-person event, but, um, you know, we're in a COVID normal world now. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll um, hopefully get to meet um, some, some, some of you in person. Um, obviously, the silver lining is that we can do this virtually and, you know, extend the love through, through, throughout the world and, uh, you know, um, uh, share. So, um, yeah, great, great to be here tonight co-presenting with uh, Stuart. Now, I will just figure out how to share my screen. Here we go. And we will begin. Da, 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 da. Okay. There we go. Uh, can we see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, the topic we're going to talk about is uh, AP, API security. So I wanted to start off and talk with um, you know when I when I was researching this topic looking at a number number of different um you know events that have happened that have involved um apis in one uh, shape shape or form so we might have heard just recently about um a social network called clubhouse now clubhouse is a very exclusive um social network that um revolves around uh you know voice voice chat so you have a group it's very, um, it's very exclusive. It's invite only, um, and it's picking up a lot of steam. So it's a very popular platform. But uh, what happened recently was that um, while the platform itself is quite exclusive, the the APIs themselves were very open, and uh, they encountered a what's called a scraping attack. So information was garnered um, not through a hack but just by available APIs uh, to get access to, you know, personal um, information. And uh, if we recall just a few uh, short years ago uh, on the Facebook platform, what happened with um, Cambridge Analytica, <laughs> a, similar, a similar set of, uh, you know, circumstances, a scraping attack. Uh, the the other one um, we might uh, recall recently was at um, Channel 9, and uh, this is quite unprecedented. The the, the actual six o'clock new, but because of this uh, denial of service attack or a DDoS, um, the six o'clock news did not happen that night. Okay, um, there were outages on websites, so um, services from the Channel Nine network, network were, um, a, you know, very abruptly disrupted. Um, Another attack that happened a couple of years ago, and this is, you know, publicly available inf in, in information, and uh, the the, um, a, the Australian National University, so they had a um, um, a malicious intruder uh, get into their network, and that went undetected for a number of number of um, a, a months, according to publicly available information. So. Um, the the intruders were able to get into the network and go undetected. They were able to cover their cover cover their tracks, uh, um, you know, change or alter logs, and uh, you know, go go about and you know, obviously steal information for a prolonged period of time. So you know, quite um, quite um, damaging and you know, huge from a reputation perspective. Now here's one that I found that was, um, you know, very interesting. Where um, in North America, a casino was hacked through a uh, IoT-enabled thermometer. Would you believe? So it it may seem very far-fetched, but uh, the hackers were able to go through the thermometer API and get access to the casino network. So while we don't exactly know what type of information was accessed, we do know that it was gigabytes upon gigabytes of information that was accessed back through, requested, and then accessed through the thermometer, okay? So, um, you know, what, what could that be? Their high roller database, their, um, you know, their revenue taking, uh, information about uh, you know their operational network who knows but uh, you know from a reputational standpoint that's um you know damaging and you know it's a very 
highly regulated um, you know industry. So I I thought to myself and uh, you know that you know what what was it a real story or was it a you know a Ocean's Eleven Finding Nemo crossover movie? So if you remember Finding Nemo, they had uh, you know the fish. Um, with a plan to escape from this, um, the fish tank. So I'd like to think that um, Nemo and his and his buddies um, made it into the aquarium to do a to do a heist at the casino, and they had um, you know a new character who was um, perhaps an electric eel, an electric eel who hacks into the network for them. So anyway, I'll leave that I'll leave I'll, I'll, I'll leave that image with you. Um, now, look, if we wanted to quantify the cost of these, uh, you know, data breaches, we can do so in a number of ways. And um, at, a, at a macro level, we can say that, uh, you know, on a per user basis, this, this is, a, this is, this is a, the, the cost. But to qualify, you know, the, the, the damage from those breaches, we can look at productivity costs. So if we look at the Nine, nine News example, um, you know, the cost of having that outage and for their advertisers is, is uh, you know, huge. Uh, recovery and technology costs. So in the ANU example, uh, we could say that, uh, you know, a, a lot of, um, you know, forensic auditing needed to happen, a lot of restoration from backups needed to happen. Uh, reputation cost, if we look at the casino, if we look at, you know, the Facebook, if we look at Clubhouse, um, do users have trust? Do consumers have trust in their in their data that it's um, that it's safe? That you're a you're a custodian of that data, okay? Compliance cost, ASIC penalties, regulators, so that type of thing. If we you know read in the um, you know in the in the news at the moment about some of the um, you know the costs uh, the, the the penalties that have been handed down to the big banks and other financial institutions for, um, you know, irregularities, you know, th th these are, these are tens of millions of dollars, you know, potentially. So when we think about APIs as an attack ve vector and what, what, what is an attack vector? So it, it's a pathway to gain unauthorized access to a computer or network and if we think about what APIs are, they're, they're a prime candidate for um, an attack into your network. So I've just highlighted some of those potential vectors that we can consider. And we need to think about when we're designing our APIs with security in mind. So we're not just thinking about, you know, do we have credentials that fit, um, or you know, APIs configured correctly. We also need to think about people as a potential and um, you know vector as well, because we have our three three tiers of um, APIs. And what if there's an internal, a, a malicious insider who has access to very weakly secured system APIs that are within a safe network? Okay. Something, something to think about. So that's um, an attack vector. Very important when we're designing APIs to think of, think about these um, think about these things. The other concept I wanted to bring up was around that of the attack surface. So if a vector is the means to get into a network, an attack surface is that area that's exposed for attack. And to illustrate that point, I've got the I've got a picture of a. A uh, very generic uh, three-tier architecture doesn't um, apply to Victoria University necessarily, but if we look at those experience, process, and system APIs, that could be affected by those attack vectors. Um, when we then look at, um, you know, who those um, you know who those stakeholders are in you know involved in governing the security of APIs. Then we need to have a look at well across those experience, process, and system APIs. Who, who's um, who's responsible for the design, development, and operations of those APIs? So we have 
project teams, we have lines of businesses, we have central IT governance, but we also have the um, you know security teams in, involved involved as well. So when we think about um, securing APIs and mitigating um, you know the vectors that can be applied to those attack services, we also need to think about well who's governing those APIs at those various layers, who's providing those guardrails that project agile project teams um, you know uh, need to provide the right level of um, policy enforcement across your APIs at those at those uh, you know various um, ver various levels there so um, your system APIs they will have a different um, you know policy profile to your experience APIs and your experience APIs that you're exposing to internal stakeholders will have different policy enforcement profiles to uh, public APIs that you're exposing out to your customers and partners. And those APIs will have different profiles to, you know, IoT devices. So we have the example of the um, IoT enabled thermometer, but we could be talking about sensors in your SCADA network or, um, you know, in a higher education context, um, you know, um, classroom classroom operations and and smart devices so yes very um very important it's a it's a, it's a first class consideration when we're designing our apis um when we're developing our apis and when we're setting policy you know um governed by our central I, it team so before I hand over to Stuart, I just wanted to, again, reiterate those points. So uh, security breaches can, can be, you know, quantified in terms of cost, but we can also qualify in terms of the types of, um, you know, damage that a breach can cause to your APIs in terms of, um, you know, uh, reputational damage, um, regulatory penalties, uh, productivity costs and cleanup costs. Okay, APIs present one of the you know the most obvious uh, attack vectors and attack services for security breaches. Okay, um, and the last point is um, you know MuleSoft API Manager. It's an excellent product for decoupling. Um, API runtime policy enforcement for security um, and le le to let developers focus on what they're good at and that's uh, designing agile, quick, um, you know, a a APIs doing that quickly and decoupling from um, policy enforcement. But we also need to be thinking about um, people and process as well. So those key roles for those APIs and um, those those roles within your organisation that are going to govern and be governed um, for policy policy enforcement. With that, I'm going to pass on to Stuart to talk about the Victoria University story. Thanks. That's my mic working. Yep. Yep. It's Good. Working well. Excellent. All right. I'm just going to share my screen. Well. Just bear with me a second. Sorry. No problem. Okay. How's that? Is that all good? Yeah. Yeah, looks good. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so my name is Stuart Pilkington. I'm from uh, Victoria University. Um, the meetup today, I want to sort of talk about um, how we went about securing our APIs using MuleSoft uh, API Manager. Uh, apologies for the accent. It's a Northern English accent with a bit of Australian and a bit of an American thrown in. So hopefully you can understand me. Um, here's our agenda. So a bit of an introduction. We're going to look at what our problems were, and then we're going to look at what the solution was, um, the challenges we faced in that solution, and also we'll have time for questions at the end. Um, 
So as I say, I'm the integration manager at Victoria University. I'm actually fairly new to Victoria University, started in uh, the beginning of this year, January 2021. Um, but previously I was working at Vision Australia where I actually introduced the MuleSoft platform there. So that was about 2015. So I've been involved with MuleSoft for about six years now. Um, Victoria University itself is a dual sector university. So basically they deal with uh, students that are higher education students, so people doing de degrees, that type of thing, and also what's known as TAFE students, uh, people doing diplomas and things. Um, we have about 45,000 students that we sort of um, use our systems on an almost daily basis. Um, and we've got about three and a half thousand uh, staff members at the moment. So just to give you some sort of context and idea of the size of the organization. Um, campuses are scattered around mainly Melbourne, uh, but there are campuses up in Sydney and also India as well. So, uh, so we do cater for both national and international students. So Victoria University's MuleSoft journey started back in 2012 um, with an on-premise solution. Um, that's when it first got established. Um, in 2017, everything was moved up to the cloud and using MuleSoft's Cloud Hub. And then 2019-20, we moved everything across from whatever version it was to Mule 4.1, um, uh, I think I think it was at the time. Uh, we're now on 4.3 for all our applications. And that was part of a, a large transformation program, which we did in coordination with um, MuleSoft and Cat Gemini to address a few things, to address the Mule versions, getting and also to look at security. So security was a big thing that came up um, and was recognized uh, a year or so ago, and we needed to address that security problem, and that's what we're gonna sort of touch on today. Um, along with that program, there's other things going on, uh, obviously moving to, across to a, an API-led um, sort of structure, away from some very sort of monolithic um, legacy implementations that we've got and also supporting any new project work as that comes along as well. So we're pretty busy, I've got lots to do. So um, number of applications, we're running about 32 applications and it's growing almost daily with the new projects coming along and various systems sort of talking to each other through those Mule applications. So we've got student management systems, uh, which is dealing with students directly. We've got e-learning systems, obviously that's become very important over the last sort of year or so, uh, as everybody's moved across to more e-learning. Uh, course information systems, which we have to get approved by the government, um, finance systems, HR, CRM systems, identity management systems. These are all talking through MuleSoft or some MuleSoft application. And then we've uh, supporting portals, so portals for both student and staff, uh, have different sort of portals. Uh, we've got an app as well, and various sort of VU, websites that are all supported by the uh, MuleSoft uh, platform. And then we've got a few sort of external parties as well, mainly around sort of finance, government, and international students. So that gives you some sort of context and idea and background about wh where VU is, hopefully, uh, in terms of the MuleSoft sort of uh, structure and what sort of things uh, are going on. So as I mentioned before, um, this is about security so security was found to be a big problem so over time and with that background going back to what 2012 um you can probably guess as is we've had multiple vendors uh different developers sort of dabbling in the code base and we built up a bit of a uh, legacy code and uh, technical debt and there's very there was varying implications of security in place so we needed to uh, get on top of it and clean it up so that was recognized as the um, problem. And so sort of this, what we went through then is sort of, well, what do we want? So each one of these problems basically uh, was sort of assessed and formed our requirements. What, what did we, we need to um, achieve with this um, solution in order to sort of move forward and improve our security? So things like outdated security policies that were in place, uh, we need to sort that out. Uh, lack of secure management of credentials. Uh, basically, credentials are being passed around, going across emails and all sorts of things. Uh, we need to get that uh, sorted out, which then led on to uh, 
a loss of visibility to some extent of who is actually accessing our APIs. Uh, as I say, a lot of history there, a lot of people have worked on the ImmuleSoft implementation at VUni. Um, and that gives um, another part of it as well is, you know, with that loss of visibility, we, we also have sort of multiple clients. So multiple clients using the same credentials to access our APIs, um, which is not good because again, you know, it's that loss of who who's actually logging in, who's actually using those APIs. And then another thing that came up was the uh, limited control on actual API resource access. So each API, as you know, is a bunch of resources. Um, but basically, at the, mo the way it was, was people could access any of our resources as long as they had the sort of uh, set of credentials. So we need to sort that out. Um, so, but overall, basically needs to conform as well to tie to more modern security that was in place. Yeah. And when a couple of other things, um, we wanted to easily add new security policies uh, on top of what we've got. And also we would like to expose more of our APIs to external clients and not necessarily uh, our internal uh, systems which we have complete control over. Um, so the solution we undertook was um, we decided we needed uh, an API manager. Yeah. So we needed some sort of API manager slash gateway to solve this problem, right? And this is where we brought in MuleSoft's API manager. And why do we go with MuleSoft? Well, it was frictionless. <laughs> uh, basically, we said we wanted it. Um, we switched it on. You know, obviously we had to pay some money for it. Um, and it was there, it was there, it was all ready to go and you know, switched on within days, if not that day. Um, we have quite a small uh, integration operational team at VU. So we didn't want to go down the path of setting up another sort of API manager gateway through another vendor and you know, creating tunnels, firewalls or whatever, and going, you know, having yet another sort of vendor to deal with. I mean, you got to look at things like training and support and all that type of thing as well. So the support obviously came with our uh, MuleSoft um, support that we already had. Um, it's simple to set up, set it up, and don't worry about the API. So I want the developers really, they should be worrying about the APIs and not necessarily worrying about production. Uh, the way things were is they were dealing with security aspects as well, and I don't really want them to worry about any sort of security. Yeah. And then finally, sort of monitoring analytics are all built in. So I switch it on and away you go. It's all there. Uh, a bit of configuration required. Um, so there's a bit of a, a little diagram. Um, basically, API manager sits out there configuring policies for the API gateway. Um, policy, uh, the API gateway is then sort of um, implementing the policies and then calling into our backend APIs. And then you've got the um, actual consumers, application consumers out there as well. Um, some examples of some of the policies you get out of the box from API Manager. Um, OAuth 2, uh, very important for us. Um, IP whitelisting, blacklisting, obviously another important one. Rate limiting, spike control, client ID, enforceable policies, cores, and there's also custom policies as well. Um, Interesting with the cores is I was actually working with a developer today and um, he was using a SharePoint application to try and uh, go through our APIs and he, he, need, he needed a cores implemented to do that. And that took about uh, 10 seconds, 20 seconds just to switch it on and it's all good and away it went. So easy to add and update policies by the UI. So what was that uh, solution? Excuse me. Um, so the solution uh, that we went for is basically we've removed our sort of um, old authentications and moved across to an OAuth authentication as our main authentication. Um, I'm sure a lot of people on this call are familiar with OAuth, uh, but it's basically, uh, we based it on um, JSON web tokens or JOT tokens, and they were going to be issued by Azure. 
Um, so they're actually set up in an issue from Azure. And then that's actually maintained by our VU infrastructure team. So basically the management of credentials and what the tokens, how the tokens are set up is completely managed by a completely uh, separate team now at VU. We don't have the integration team sort of worrying about all that side of things. Um, so quick, there's a quick diagram of how all sort of works. Um, so client requests a token into Azure, they get the token back, client uses their own credentials, um, call the API with the access token, uh, goes to API manager, it in turn sort of validates the token to make sure everything's fine, um, talks to Azure to do that validation, and then talks to the actual Mule application um, to actually talk to the guts of the API as it were, and then obviously returns the call. So a couple of things that helped solve these the problems we had before was each client now gets their own set of credentials. Yeah. So if people have been sharing credentials, then you know we send that send around the uh, police. No, we don't. But anyway, so each client gets their own set of credentials. They're obviously responsible for um, using those and carefully sort of managing those credentials to make sure they don't hand them out anywhere else. Um, and each client as well is actually restricted on which methods and resources they are allowed to access. So this was quite important for us in that we didn't want everybody to access everything. We've got some APIs that should only, parts of those resources should only be accessed by certain clients, especially when it comes to sort of personal information and financial information, which might sit in the same API. Um, tokens are short-lived, so it's difficult to share a token because it only lasts for a certain amount of time. Um, so all our external APIs, and this is something what Nick was touching on before, is what we've done with our external APIs. In, we call an external API something that a client would call. They've all moved across to auth and internal APIs. Internal APIs is basically a MuleSoft application calling another MuleSoft application. We've moved across to a, a client ID policy. Uh, for those guys. Some of the challenges uh, that we had, um, there's always challenges as everybody on this call knows, there wouldn't be a proper IT implementation without challenges. Um, our, our RAML, our RAML was, uh, some of the complex RAML that we had was non-compliant for exchange and in order to use API manager properly, you need to have compliant RAML. Um, so there's quite a bit of fixing that was required um to that raml and then obviously because we fixed all the raml then we have to go through 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 a full regression testing cycle um we have limited control over a client's development timelines um each client has their own development timeline so we can't just use a big bang approach you can't just say to everybody all right from tomorrow we are going to all use oauth here's your credentials go away type thing. So we needed to basically work with each client one by one, testing in all our different environments uh, to make sure we can get them across. Um, which also meant and also um, required us to keep the outdated authentication while we introduced OAuth. So basically we have to keep the old one while we also push them across the new one. When they're all across the new one, we switch them off. Um, and that basically got us away out of the old uh, authentication. A bit of a mild, mild challenge, I'll call it. Um, the integration team, I guess, are now dependent on another VU team for setting up the tokens, <laughs> which was, isn't really a problem, but as we sort of went through this cycle and we were testing things and changing things, we were then reliant on this other team to actually set up the tokens for us because we didn't have access to Azure. Um, obviously for internal security reasons so yeah so it was a bit of a challenge there as we went through those setups once the setups were done though then it kind of all done you don't need to worry about it again um and then the final one is clients and they need to provide all the endpoints that we're using uh because we have resource restrictions we were based we made we need to make sure that all the endpoints the clients were using we'd got them covered in the tokens yeah, so the actual restriction was actually built inside the token itself using token claims. Um, and so we have to make sure we didn't miss any unless it didn't work. And then finally, as usual, lots of testing. So we have to make sure that we didn't cut anybody off or break anybody. So there's lots of um, 
testing involved. So hopefully, hopefully that gives you a bit of a, a picture um, of our journey of, to using API Manager and hopefully it's uh, prompted some thoughts and uh, ideas. So I'm just going to move. I believe we've got a few minutes. I know I kind of went over a bit, but um, for questions, but yeah. Thanks, Stuart. Thanks, Nick. That uh, was super interesting. So if anyone has any questions, uh, please post them in the chat. Um, we had a bit of a discussion there already. A question came up um, whether API Manager was only supported on Cloud Hub or whether it supports any of the other deployment models as well. So if that's the case, you know, you can have an, an on-prem deployment uh, of a Mule runtime or a containerized deployment like Runtime Fabric, for example. Uh, and you can secure those endpoints using API Manager as well. Um, so that's on the chat. So anyone else has any questions? What's the difference between Cloud Hub and on-premise? So I can take that one maybe. So Cloud Hub is a, is a fully managed uh, deployment model managed by MuleSoft. So you essentially just through a control plane uh, or through AnyPoint Studio, can deploy your apps. You just specify the, the size of the worker that you want to deploy it on, um, and the rest is happening in the background. Now, with on-prem, essentially self-managed, so you can deploy the Mule runtime or, on a server, on a VM, or maybe on your private cloud, meaning an EC2. Yes, but it means you have to provide the infrastructure, right? Uh, the VM, uh, the networking, etc. So that's sort of the key difference. And another question that just came up uh, for Nick and Stuart, did you have semantic versioning implemented within your RAML before you did the corrections and re-implementation on new apps? That's a very good question. I might throw that out over to Alex Fernandez, who was the um, integration architect uh, across this in, in, in engagement. So. Um, Alex, do you have a do you have an answer for that? I believe the answer is no. We didn't have semantic versioning um, enabled, um, but Alex uh, should be should be able to confirm that point or not. You and I think we've um, given uh, Alex, uh, Alex is here. Ah uh, uh, yes, Nick. Uh, for every changes on the Ramel, uh, there should be a, sub, a there should be a subsequent uh, update on the version, so which is. When we you save the RAML specification when it's saved to any point exchange, it will be automatically versioned. So that's the version which we refer to our projects. Uh, uh, hopefully, it should answer your question. Cool, thanks. Well, interest of time. Um, let's take one more uh, question. Uh, could you use MuleSoft to access Azure, or must you have? Uh, a direct non-mule interface as per your diagram. I think that's for Stuart. Sorry, what was the question again? I missed the... No, that's okay. Uh, could you use MuleSoft to access Azure or must you have a direct non-mule interface as per your diagram? Oh, we, we had a... Um, so our clients would call a basically a Microsoft endpoint. So they'll call an Azure sort of endpoint to get the token. Still, I add to that. I think based on the diagram, uh, in the JWT token implementation, uh, 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 the JWT itself will call Azure to get all the JWT um, metadata. To when the token is provided on the header, uh, it will validate that the token is this, uh, what they call this is valid. So basically, there's a sync up that's go going to happen in there. I'm sorry, I forgot what's the concept about that, but yeah, it's basically it's, it will get the metadata from uh, the Azure uh, Azure URL. Okay, cool. Thanks, Alex. That's great. Okay, so thanks everyone. Thanks, Stuart and, and Nick and Alex uh, for that super interesting presentation. It, it also shows how MuleSoft is really working very strongly with our partners. In this case, Capgemini and our clients together. Uh, I think it's a great story of that good collaboration we're doing there. So thanks again. Right, so I'll hand over to Adam now uh, for the second presentation of today around our product roadmap and AnyPoint Data Graph. Over to you, Adam.
I may have to get off mute first. Sorry, guys. Can you hear me okay now? Perfect. Thanks. All right. Awesome. Uh, let me present this. Too many screens, too much going on. Uh, that's okay. We'll get there eventually. Um, so, yeah, thanks for your time this evening. What we wanted to run through really was a product map, roadmap overview um, of, you know, what we've, what we've been able to achieve, um, you know, in the, in the not too distant past, so just semi-recently, and also, you know, looking ahead to what's coming in the future. Now, in terms of the uh, highlight for this evening um, and the interest of time, it's going to be quite brief in terms of the product roadmap. We have an external webinar that actually takes you through, um, you know, in a lot of detail, the themes that we're focusing on um, in a lot more detail, what has recently been released. And then we sort of look at, you know, over the next probably two years, what's actually coming um, and give you some idea of some of those features, the, the areas that we're focusing on, um, and I strongly encourage you to get access to that and have a review of that. Um, tonight, we'll be just touching on it quite briefly of, you know, what the latest one sort of entailed and some highlights in that. But we're going to be focusing fundamentally on AnyPoint Datagraph, which is a recently related, uh, released component that we're all pretty excited about. Now, like any uh, product roadmap session, uh, you'll always see one of these slides. Now. You can go through and read all of this. This session's obviously being recorded as well. Um, if I have to summarize this, I would say make any purchasing decisions based on what is generally available in the product at this point in time, um, not in anything that is forward looking because that is always subject to change. Okay, now we've got that out of the way. Um, I just wanted to provide a bit of context as to how we go about making changes um, to the product set, to the platform, and how ideas come to fru fruition. And a big part of that is from the community. It's from you guys out there. So first of all, I just want to say thank you. Um, you know, we do take your feedback seriously. Um, you know, the ideas that are provided um, back to us and the votes that are applied to that actually really do make a difference. Um, so we've been able to actually release 14 new ideas in the last quarter um, that were provided, you know, um, by the community. Uh, 27 of those have been um, collaborated with or expanded upon, um, and 36 of those, you know, we've taken into consideration through that process as well. So keep voting, um, keep registering your ideas and submitting those um, because, you know, eventually if enough people are, um, jumping up and down about a certain capability or um, feature uh, you, that will, you know, go a long way into making its way into the generally available product. Now, we focus, I guess, on um, the roadmap or the product capability uh, fundamentally in four different areas, which is around APIs, uh, integration, connectivity, and uh, you know, last but definitely not least, the platform itself. Um, and so across those four different domains or tiers, um, you know, we have delivered quite a lot in the last six months, as you can see from some of the items here. I'm not going to go through each one in detail. This is more, I guess, of a, a highlight of some of the things that have been released. Um, but you can see things, you know, such as, you know, the um, data we functions is Studio 7.8 from, you know, doing the full lifecycle support for OAS version three, and then all the way down to things like Connectus for Composer, which is, um, you know, Composer was released um, not too long ago as well. Now, in terms of the next six months for forward looking, um, you know, we're really excited about the likes of being able to have evented APIs. Um, so around the discovery and design of um, asynchronous APIs, um, which is really cool. And I'm really looking forward to that. Um, in this particular slide, it says data graphs coming in the next six months. That actually has been released. So, um, you know, that's that's something we'll cover in a bit more detail today. This was actually taken from 
um, the recently released roadmap, which is um, a little while ago. Um, but also in addition to that, um, you know, there is a lot more coming in this space and, you know, we're really excited about that, especially also looking at sort of the auto cataloging of APIs, whether they're mule, uh, mule APIs or non-mule as well, and sort of what that looks like from a, um, you know, a cataloging and metadata perspective moving forward. All right, so obviously we're going through an evolution and, you know, we sort of um, saw this a little bit earlier with Stuart's uh, talk in terms of, you know, where Victoria Uni started and where they've come to and sort of that evolution of a journey. Um, as most of you have been around for quite some time, um, but, you know, you're probably aware of the history, but for the newcomers, you know, we sort of started off almost as a, an ESB type approach, um, you know, sort of focused in that SOA architecture space. Um, and what sort of happened is we've evolved, you know, as the, the trends and our customer demands have changed over time, um, you saw us, you know, increase uh, our capability with an API management um, capability. And that became that unified platform that you see now in the AnyPoint platform of today. Um, you know, we're, and that could have catapulted us into, um, you know, realms of having, you know, being a, a leader in the magic quadrant from Gartner for both integration platform as a service and full lifecycle API management, which we're the only vendor that actually does that, which is which is fantastic. Um, being able to scale and secure and being essential to IT. But where are we actually heading? Where do we really want to go to? And it's all built on, you know, forming that application network, that pluggable architecture, and really making your business composable, accessible by anyone and being able to connect everything. Okay, so this is really where we're heading. Um, and, you know, the features such as being able to take on a, a lot more capability from anything within your integration ecosystem, not just MuleSoft, but also outside of that is really important. Um, and we really want to enable, uh, you know, the organizations to actually be able to do this to really accelerate the clock speed of their business. With all that being said, um, I want to shift gears now. Um, you know, on June the 4th, uh, we announced the release of AnyPoint Data Graph. Um, so that went to um, you know, general availability and it's now built into the product. Um, and what we're going to focus on now for the, for the rest of this um, sort of section is what Data Graph actually is, what problem is it solving and what it means to you moving forward. So, I have this conversation probably every day with prospects and customers around the value that MuleSoft can bring as a platform, as a, an architectural approach, and also that operating model with the C4E. And we talk a lot around, you know, moving away from pure custom code development and point-to-point -point integration um, and being able to create, you know, modern APIs that are independently managed, independently secured, discoverable, and set up for reusability. And as we start to, you know, um, see those principles applied in, in your implementation and you start to build out these foundational APIs that can be leveraged and reused across multiple initiatives, that's where you really see the, the benefit moving forward. Now, what happens with this in, in reality is there is a slight amount of rework, okay, that is actually done when you take those reusable components it might be minimal and it will still save you a lot of time in the long run but there is still a little bit of work that needs to be done to tweak those add additional resources or um, you know different operations potentially or tweak those for the consumers that are coming um, on board there and what we really want to get to is how do we take those assets but reduce the additional work that's required to deliver those um, innovative solutions that might be um, you know demanded very quickly. So taking a step back, I mean, the, the REST APIs that we, we talk about and we deliver as part of our projects um, provide a lot of benefits. And, you know, I'm sure most of you are across this, you know, generally they have a sort of a request response. Um, you know, there's logic associated with these. They're independently secured and managed. And by using things like any point exchange, we can share and catalog um, and promote, promote reuse across our teams. 
But what happens is as we start to sprawl these out and we get more and more APIs, um, as you're trying to consume multiple, you know, there might be process APIs predominantly, uh, but even down to the system API level, um, what happens is in order to pass the data that's required in a specific format, you might need to call or orchestrate multiple process APIs to get exactly what you're looking for. And what happens with this as well is you get all of the fields returned. And then it's up to you to you know, transform that or strip out what is not required and then present that up either to an experience API or to your you know, mobile application or your front end consuming application that's required. So there is still that level of orchestration that needs to happen. Um, and sometimes you know, custom code is needed to, to pass that data that's needed from each response. So every time you've got a unique uh, use case, um, a lot of the time you will have to do some tweaking around this. So this is sort of where we, we were currently at and to address this problem, you know, looking forward, we want to be able to reuse multiple APIs at once, but do so with one request, not have to go through and manipulate or create additional orchestration APIs uh, for each use case that comes along. So how do we actually go about doing that? And that's where any point data graph obviously comes into play. So what this does is it creates a unified graph, um, which really unlocks um, the, the efficiencies that you can get for any specific queries you have on specific sets of data. So you build out your foundational APIs that we probably see across lots of organizations currently, but how do we actually get access to specific items or data sets from multiple APIs without having to regenerate and build and go through the whole process for a new API. So for example, um, with one particular query, we can use this unified graph to say, give me orders, status, and expected delivery, which may come from three different APIs. Or alternatively, how do we reuse a different type of query to say, okay, well, let's you know, I've got a new requirement now, I need to access information across my product, customer and shipment, but I only need these specific fields. Don't return everything, this is a query I'm looking for. So how do we make that dynamic? How do we improve and speed up the acceleration of this? And this is really all achieved for each um, project through this any, any point data graph capability that's been released. So what this does is it unifies these APIs into reusable services, okay? So you, you create these uh, mappings or relationships between certain APIs and via a single request or query, you can actually surface up this information at rapid speed. That can then be um, you know, obtained and that query can be reused um, based on GraphQL and you can actually generate that endpoint that you can serve up to you know, your developer or your consumer uh, very quickly. So I'm gonna jump into a quick demonstration just to uh, show you how this sort of works for anyone who hasn't seen that yet. That's the wrong environment, bear with me. Here we go. All right, so I am in the AnyPoint platform. Just make sure I'm still logged in with a bit of luck. Beautiful, hasn't kicked me out yet. So when you get access to AnyPoint data graph, you'll see a new sort of link here, and it's also included in the hamburger menu that everyone's probably very used to uh, within Cloud Hub. If we click on the link here, it'll take you into data graph. Now, for those of you who have access to this capability, uh, this demonstration is based on a quick start tutorial that's available publicly within our documentation. Um, it's actually really good. It leverages two different APIs um, that are already within Exchange. So you can actually use those specification and leverage the mocking service to surface up this information um, just to validate how the process of data graph actually works. So. I'm not gonna step you through from start to finish that, that whole tutorial and how we can assign relationships and how we bring the APIs in. But what I wanna do is just take you through at a high level how this component works and how it fits together. So initially you'll need to add 
some APIs to your to your unified graph. And in this point, what I've done is I've brought in an order API as well as a product API. Okay, so these were from Exchange. You go through a wizard process to be able to add these particular APIs. Now, in looking at the particular API schema itself, um, you can see here the, the different types of responses and the nested types that are actually provided um, from this particular Catalyst Order API. And if I look at the details that are associated with that, this gives you the information that's sort of brought in when you um, add this API to your graph, okay? So we can see the um, URL here. I've got no authentication in this point, but you've got the option to add that if you want to for policy enforcement. Um, in this case, I kept it pretty simple. Now, we can look at the order responses, which I've, I've actually um, added to the graph uh, as part of what we need to return back for, for those queries. And as you can see here, um, you know, we've got a whole bunch of fields that have been made visible um, that can be queried against as part of the unified graph here as well. Um, and we have got a uh, merge that's been added with the uh, product API as well. If I take a step back, I'm just going to cancel down here. So I don't want to make any changes. Um, and the other one we looked at was the product API that we brought into the unified graph. So here we can see um, you know, a bunch of uh, methods that have been made visible. Um, you've got the option to make those hidden or not. And again, if we look at the product response that I've created, um, we've created a collaboration here. So it's doing a search based on that. And we also have a merge um, that is applied to the product response option from um, the order API as well. So after all that set up, um, I'm going to take a step back and I'll show you the unified schema. So when we get to the unified schema, what we see here is a whole bunch of query methods that are available at our disposal that we can actually use. We can create queries um, that's based on GraphQL that can deliver different sets of data across these APIs in our unified schema. Now, if I click on run a query, I have one that I've prepared earlier. Um, and as you can see with this particular query, I've got you know shipping address, I've got the total and the status that's coming from the order API. And then within the you know the product information, model, description, brand, price, um, all these inf all these informations, all these types of fields that I'm looking for are actually coming from the product API as well. So that's been mapped from the, the shipment items and the order items to that product ID as well. So what we can do is actually run this query and I can run it directly here within Datagraph. Pray to the demo gods and we do have a response that's coming back. Okay, so we've got um, some order information as well as some product information as well. So we haven't had to create a new um, high level API and go through a design and build and deployment process. Um, all we've been able to do is just create that um, unified schema, run this query, and we've got the data we're looking for. What's really cool about this is we can actually copy this endpoint. So we can use this to actually run this query again. Um, so we can copy the query as a GraphQL query or as a CR. See URL snippet as well. We've got those options, um, and we can you know copy that and give that to our developers or whoever wants to consume this particular query. Um, one other thing I want to talk about is, which is pretty cool, is the ability to trace the query as well. So what I'm going to do is turn on tracing, and I'm going to run this query again. And what this does is, as it's returning or running that query. And getting my response back, what it actually gives you is a, a view of what is actually being called in the back end. So, what this means is you can sort of see here some timing associated with it and the response times. But depending on the type of field, you can see where it's actually being consumed by. So, it's calling the order API here, and each of these particular fields are being returned from the order API. And then at this point, you see it actually goes across to the product API. 
And this is where the responses come back and the time associated with that. But we also get all of these fields that are returned from the product API. So not only does it verify or validate what you've actually called and where it's coming from, it also shows you um, some responses around that traceability as well, which is really cool. Uh, last but not least, the final thing I just wanted to touch on is the log. So it actually gives you the option to view the response logs as well, um, which will bring up a, a new log within the data graph and we can see what's actually happening there as well. So I know that was pretty short and sweet. Um, it is something that's um, you know, quite exciting for us. It's a new way, a new step into that um, field of really speeding up what's you know, possible from a consumption standpoint and really driving reusability. Um, but yeah, feel free to, um, you know, take a look at some of the information that's out there around this recently released product. Um, and more than happy to have any follow up conversations around this with um, anyone who's interested. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it back to you, Daniel. Thanks, Adam. Um, there have been a couple of questions now in the chat. Um, so first one was, how can we try out data graph? Um, does it come with a separate license? So as per the chat for free prod and prod environment, you need a separate license. Um, but if you just go on to any point and you create a new um, tr uh, a trial account, essentially, at any point, it will have data graph enabled, so you can just try it out and play around with it a little bit. Um, all right, so what do we have? Then there's another question. How do how do the data graph call the internal APIs? Do we provide the credential of the internal APIs being reused in data graph? Yeah, so you've got the option when you set up that unified um, query and when we're actually setting um, the way that we're actually querying um, those APIs, you've got a whole bunch of different options associated with that. You might have seen in my demonstration, I just had no authentication. I just wanted to go straight through um, for the sake of simplicity. But you do have, you know, client ID enforcement and there's other um, policies that you can add to that as well. Excellent. And there's a question whether there's a query builder available to prepare the query. Uh, that is a good question. I mean, I used a predefined query um, in that sort of window that it was built out. Um, so I'm not sure the level of um, capability there, but um, okay. yeah, something maybe we can circle back on. Excellent. Yeah. Um, One thing I did want to add, Daniel, it might not be a question, but it was something that I found out today because um, it was something that came up in a discussion was I think it was a really good question. It was like, does Datagraph only apply to Mule applications that are running in our runtime? And a colleague of mine actually tested this. And what she was able to do was actually bring in a RAML specification into Exchange that was leveraging an external API that was running. And she was still able to query parts of that response, even though it was not a Mule API. So that even just extends the boundary of what's possible with this as well, which is pretty cool. That's awesome. That also means if you use service mesh, for example, to incorporate non mule applications, as long as you have a RAML app and as long as you have that application um, in exchange, you'll be able to query that over data graph as well. Yep, spot on. That's great. Um, another one, uh, what was it? Query builder, we do have to, uh, does data graph only run on cloud hub? So that probably means, you know, runtime fabric or on-prem, is that supported as well? That's a good one. Well, yeah, that is a good question. Um, my assumption is that it is only available like within the control plane. So if you've got, you know, as a prerequisite, you need API manager for this. Um, so it wouldn't matter where you're actually, where your run time deployment is, but as long as you're going through the AnyPoint platform uh, from the control plane, that should be fine. Yeah, that makes sense. Right, any other questions? We've got two minutes to go. Um, 
don't see anything else in there. So feel free to put more questions into the chat. So maybe over the next 20 minutes, Adam will can have a look at the questions here. Oh yeah, that was one that I missed, apologies. How does the trace calculate response time per field? Short answer is I don't know. <laughs> um, I haven't gone to that level of detail yet. Um, I just saw the capability was there. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's a great question. Um, yeah, again, we can maybe circle back unless there's someone else on the call um, who has more detail on that, feel free to pitch in. Cool, awesome. Well, thanks, Adam, that was super interesting. Uh, new capabilities, that's, that's always good. And as you can see from our roadmap as well, we're constantly rolling out new capabilities. And uh, so it, it does really make sense to sign up for that webinar that we run every quarter to see what's coming down the track. And there's a few really interesting things coming down the track as well. So thanks again. Okay, so now it's time for some trivia. <clears throat> so as always, um, yes, we've got uh, prices to be won um, around that. Hold on a second. I quickly need to stop that again and start the actual Kahoot game in the background go all right let's go back to this here all right cool so we've got the next 20 minutes to to run a kahoot game where there's there's prizes to be won so what are the prices you will probably ask so the um the first prize is a training voucher that is uh, available for every training on on mulesoft and we're constantly rolling out new training capabilities and, and new training courses. Uh, second prize is a hoodie, MuleSoft hoodie. And third prize is a delivery, delivery food voucher of $30. So the best way to play it is essentially open your mobile phone and either use the Kahoot app um, or go to the web browser and type in kahoot.it. We will give you a game pin in a minute, um, and you can then provide that game pin and your name in order to play this. And if you want to win a prize, please use your real name. So we know who to send the prizes to. Right, so let's get started. I'll give you a minute or so to uh, open up kahoot.it on your web on your mobile browser um, or in the kahoot app and put in the game pin 2660366 put that into the chat as well and the way this works um, so for those of you who've attended the uh, the meetups you will probably know the rules for the newbies um, in the meetup, uh, we have 10 questions. Um, there's four answers, only one is correct. And essentially on that app, what you will have to do is you click on the color uh, that equates to the correct answer. Uh, it's not just important to answer the question correctly, but the quicker you answer the question, the more points you get as well. So speed definitely matters. All right, let's wait uh, for a few more minutes as well before we get started. Got 25 people who are already in the game, so that's great. So 10 questions. Um, the questions will be about the content that was presented today. Uh, but we have thrown in a couple of random questions as well that are not MuleSoft related. Actually, yes, there is a Euro question in there. Of course, there has to be. All right, I think we're 28 people. So let's get started.
So first one, that's an easy one. Um, you will not be evaluated for that, just for, for the new people on the ground uh, in order to try it out. So there's no points for this question. Just try it out um, and just click on one of the, on one of the colors. Okay, cool. All right, so that was a bit of a, a trial. So we all start with uh, zero points. Let's get to the first question. What company made the first cell phone in 1973? A couple of big names there, but who did the first one? Right, and the correct answer is Motorola. They were actually a little bit earlier than Nokia. I know Nokia, a lot of people had Nokia phones first, but Motorola was a trailblazer in that area. So we have our leaderboard that will be updated after every single question. Peter Wong currently leading. Second question or third one now. User data of which social media platform were recently leaked online? And the correct answer is Clubhouse. That's the new audio social media platform um, where a sizable number of user data were leaked online. I think it was about in April, just at the time when they were growing their, their, their base, right? Um, I'm sure they would have done well with a bit of API manager in their platform. And we've got Biesh Krishna currently leading the pack. So next question. Which is not an API policy supported in API Manager? And we've got 14 correct answers. That's correct. SOAP message validation is not an API policy. So you can still, of course, do SOAP message validation on the platform, but you wouldn't do it in API Manager. You would do it in Data Week. All right. The other three, spike control, that's for rate limiting, uh, client ID enforcement, uh, and, and course for security. These are API policies that are supported in AnyPoint API Manager. And we've got Amy leading the pack. That looks good. Right, next question. Which city will host a meetup straight after today's Melbourne meetup? Good, and most of you got that right. That's Singapore. So straight after this meetup, uh, 7 p.m. Australian time, 5 p.m. Singapore time, next meetup is happening. If you're keen to continue, a super interesting topics happening there. And Vivian is current, well, actually Vivian and Nick, uh, neck to neck with 36, 32 points. So that's gonna be a, a close call. Next question. Approximately how much of Earth's water is fresh drinkable water? And the correct answer is 3%. Wow, most of you got that one right. And we've got Nick on top now uh, with more than four and a half thousand points. Right. Um, how many ideas were added and reviewed in the first quarter of 2021 through the MuleSoft Ideas Portal? Oh, 
Ooh, interesting. So the correct answer is 163, but the answers are pretty evenly spread out. Yep. So just the first quarter, we got 163 new ideas, reviewed them, and some of them made it into a new product. So uh, just, you know, thank you from my end as well. I'm sure there's a few of you who submitted new ideas. Uh, feel free to bring them in. So we're review reviewing them on a regular basis and make the product a lot better that way. And Nick is on top, but Nicky Lesh um, has been on a streak of five. So there's quite a bit of competition there. What are the four areas the MuleSoft roadmap is aligned to? APIs, integration, connectivity, and what is the fourth area? And that's platform. That's the correct answer. 10 of you got that one right. Now, the other topics, of course, are also super critical for us. But the roadmap, we group all of the roadmap items into APIs, integration, connectivity, and platform. I really recommend to, to join the webinar next time. Usually, um, I think the next one will be around August. I believe the next one's in August. And Hiralal has taken over the lead. Two more questions to go. What is the name of the new product highlighted, highlighted in our roadmap session? What is the correct name? Ooh, okay. Any point data graph is actually the official name of the product so six of you got that right now under the covers we're using graphql uh, which is a framework um, but the correct product name is any point data graph vivian has taken over the leader again okay so final question and it's gonna be a non-mule question and um, Adam already gave a little bit of a, a teaser of what that could be about. So for the Europeans uh, on here, you will be aware that currently there's a football tournament happening in Europe, the Euro 2020, which was moved to 2021. So last question has to be about that. Who won the last Euro in 2016? And the correct answer is Portugal. They won last time. They finished third in the in the round and then made it all the way to the final and won it. And just this morning they qualified again, uh, being third. Well, let's see how, how far they get. Okay, that was it. Let's see who won this meetup Kahoot game. Number three, Daniel Lee. Number two, Nick. And number one is Vivian. So congratulations to the winners. Um, and thank you, everyone, for staying until the end um, and participating in these meetups. Um, thank you again for the speakers. Thanks to Nick, Stuart, and Adam for the fantastic presentations. And um, yeah, we'll stick around for a few more minutes. If you have any more questions, please um, stay around. and. Post them in the chat. Otherwise, hopefully we'll see a lot of you in September, either virtual or if it's possible in person. So thanks everyone for joining and have a good evening.
Thanks, guys. Good job. See you later. Thanks, Adam. Yep. Thanks, all. Catch you later. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Stuart. Thanks, Nick. That was a super interesting presentation. Yep. Thank you again. Thanks, Daniel. Cheers. Yep. All right. See you around. Yeah.